Okay, well I have another Magnavox. It's a different model this time. This time it is a ZV450MW8. And the customer states that the unit powers on, will accept the tape, and then shuts down about three seconds later. Let's take a look at the back of it. So I see the antenna input and output, but I do not see an HDMI output on this one. It does have the cutout for it, but it does not have the HDMI. And according to the front of this unit, it does have a standard ATSC tuner, standard definition TV tuner, as you can see right here. So I wonder why they didn't put an HDMI output on the back of this thing. Anyhow, let's get the top off, take a look at it, put a tape in it, and see what it actually does. Okay, I've got the unit opened up. Just taking a look around in here, see if I see anything abnormal. Belt is attached over here on this side. And I do see some wear on the pinch roller, which means that this unit has been used in the past. As well as, let's zoom in on the video cylinder here. And it does have some use on it. This is not a mint virgin machine by any means. Definitely is going to need a cleaning. It's got a lot of oxidation collected on the upper drum assembly. Not sure what that is right there. But it will need to have a cleaning. So next thing, let's go ahead and pop a tape into it and see what happens. Now this one is a newer version than the ZV-427 or ZV-457. You can see it has a much, much smaller DVD board. I've never had an issue with the DVD boards on these units. They might have improved something over the years. It does have the standard fan back here. A little bit of uh, dust buildup on the fan, but nothing really to speak of. Looks really good inside, very clean, other than the... Uh, tape oxide deposits on the video cylinder itself. So let's power it up, see what it's gonna do. I'm betting mode select switch at this point. Might be kinda of hard to see in there, but there is a clock display. It's very dim. So let's hit the power button. And I do see the tape in logo light up and I do see over here the VCR light does light momentarily so here is the power button so as you can see it does power up and then immediately shuts down again I'm not pressing it a second time one press power up then it shuts down so at this point I'm suspecting and input to the microprocessor is not detecting one of the voltages. So I've got to see if I can find a schematic on this thing and do a little bit of troubleshooting and see what I can come up with. Okay, so here's a schematic of the system control on this unit. And I'm interested in pins 79 and pins 80 right here. VCR power safety and DVD power safety. I need to make sure when this powers up, I get 5.2 volts on pin 80 and 3 volts on pin 79. And so if you follow VCR power safety, it comes down here. It does power the take up reel emitter as well right here. And then if you continue to follow it down here, it goes to the power on 5 volt line right there. So I need to make sure that it is making 5 volts. And that comes from this transistor right here, Q1056, it looks like. Awfully small printing. Power on, 5 volts. So here's one of the plugs for the DVD player right here. And if I fold this back just a tad, you can notice a jumper that says power on, 5 volts. So I can actually measure the voltage right there without having to pull the chassis completely out of the unit. Here's the loading belt right here and then this is the VCR mechanism on this side but I think I can get my probe in there no problem and we'll just go ahead and do a quick measurement to see if we have that voltage there first okay so voltmeter is attached power on and I never see a voltage above about 0.5 volts I have it in min max right now so 0.57 is the highest voltage 
that I see out of this thing. I power this thing on three times now and I can't get above 0 0.057 volts. Not 0.57, but 0 0.057. So I'm going to switch the AC power off into the unit. I'm going to go to ohms. And I see 800 ohms. That's perfectly fine. I don't see a short anywhere. But because we don't have that voltage, power back on, point, point 0.055, it tried to power up on its own. That's going to be the problem. It needs to see the 5 volts back to the microprocessor or it's going to shut the unit back down. Okay, I haven't pulled the chassis completely out yet, but I did flip the DVD drive up and out of the way. You can kind of see it sitting right here. I've got my voltmeter in the DC volt range. And here's Q1056 right there. And so the pinout is emitter collector base. So the first thing, I'm going to put this in the ohm range and check the emitter. We should see about 800 ohms like we did before. And we do. Collector, which is going to be the 5 volt supply. I see a capacitor and charging. That is perfectly fine. And then on the base, I see 151 ohms. Isn't that strange? 151 ohms. Let's look at the schematic real quick. Take a look and see what is attached to the base of this transistor. It's a 150 ohm resistor and I'm reading 151 ohms from base to ground. I'm betting there's a capacitor on this line and it is going to be shorted. R1057. Let me see if I can find out without having to pull this thing completely apart. R1057. Well, there it is right there, R1057. So this side should be connected to the base. And I get 151 ohms. And let's see what we have on the other side, if I cannot block the meter. And I see 0.4 ohms. That is going to be the problem. Is it this capacitor? Is it this capacitor? Let's explore a little bit deeper in the schematic. But first, this is the ground side, should be zero. This is the hot side, and it should not be zero. I've got 0.4 ohms. Is it just that capacitor that's bad? C1058, could it be that simple? That would be totally awesome if it was. I still got to pull the chassis out of this thing to get to the bottom of it, but if it's 1058, that's going to be a trip right there. Let me find out where that goes in the schematic. So following the schematic right here, this is where my short to ground is on the emitter of this transistor right there. No capacitor there, and it comes down here to the power on 9 volt. And that's continued on page 6 of 7, so I need to go print page 6. One moment, please. So it appears the power on 9 volt actually goes two places, so if I follow this around right here, I'll find C1451, which is a 47 at 16 volts, which I doubt is the problem. And on this diagram, power on 9 volts goes through a jumper wire and then to C2391, which is a 100 at 10 volts. That might be the issue if it weren't for this. This is a board view of the components and nothing actually lines up here with what I actually have. I don't have these two regulators where the power supply connector comes in right here. I have one regulator up here, but I don't have these two. And there's Q1056. It's facing the wrong direction. So even though this is the correct service manual, this might be a slightly different revision. So I'm just going to have to pull the board out and see if that capacitor is actually bad, I'll have to unsolder it. And then chances are, if it is defective, then more likely than not, this Q1055 right here is probably blown out. So I need to find out if I have 11.7 volts on the collector of that transistor before I go too terribly much farther. But I may have to do some circuit tracing just to find out where this thing lives. Because like I said, the service manual that I have is drastically different than the board that's actually in the unit. 
So it might be kind of hard to see, but there's Q1055 right there. And so if I measure from the emitter to ground, I get 0.4 ohms. So there's the collector open. There's the base. And we're good on that. So let's go ahead and put this back in the volt range. I'm going to set this on 60 volts and we'll power this thing on and see if I get my, I think it was 11 volts there. And I do, 11.89. So that tells me that the input to that transistor is good. So what do I have on the base? And I get nothing on the base. Let's power this on. And I get 0.7 volts on the base of that transistor, which might be a problem. It might not. It might just be because the transistor is actually shorted internally from base to emitter. But I only get 1.3K from base to ground, so it just might be an internal fault. I'm not sure. We'll have to figure that out. I think it's just going to be a bad transistor because I'm measuring the base drive resistor right here. When I power this on, I see 4.3 volts and then it goes back down. And so I'll show you where that resistor is in the circuit. That's R1056. And that resistor lives right here. And it's a voltage divider network from the always 44 volt source. Well, power on 44 volts at least. And so I'm getting four and a half volts on this side and zero on this side. So between that 10K dropping resistor and that 1K, I'd say that's about right. So it's, it's designed to limit the current across this Zener diode, which is probably about a 10 volt Zener diode. Can't quite make out the numbers on that. But I'm gonna go ahead and replace that transistor and then we'll change that capacitor that is not in the service manual and we'll see where we go from there. Okay, I have the original KTC3198 out of the unit. Let's go ahead and pop it into the MK168 and see what it has to say. And it actually tests good. That's absolutely amazing. Beta of 146, forward voltage of 0.641 volts, emitter collector base. Wow, would not have thought that. So let's go ahead and test a brand new one. This is a original brand new KTC3198 replacements that I keep in stock. See how close it is to the original one. A lot higher beta, 355. Well, let's go ahead and test that capacitor and see what it says in the unit. So I have it between pin one and three. And it says 0.15 ohms. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and put the new transistor in this unit just to be safe. And this is a 100 at 16. I would not have suspected a 16 volt cap to go bad on a nine volt line. Well, it is a Suscon suspect capacitor. So let's pop another 116 in there and a brand new KTC 3198 and see what happens. Okay, so new KTC 3198 transistor installed in Q 1055 and a brand new Lelon 100 at 25 volt cap installed. So let's go ahead and measure ohms first to ground. And I see 2.3K, which is perfectly fine. Let's just go ahead and power this thing on. It's loosely assembled right now. It's not back in the frame whatsoever. And just see what we get. I'm gonna put this in the 60 volt range. And I see nine volts. That is a very good sign. That's what I wanna see. So next let's look at the power on five volt command. And I'll hit the power button over here. And look at that. I see 5.1 volts and it's actually staying on. And the DVD is trying to load. You heard a little clunk right there. That is excellent. Well, while this thing's all torn apart, Let's see if it'll accept a tape and try to play a tape because if it's this far apart, I might need to service the mode select switch. Okay, units on and staying on. Let's switch it over to the VCR mode. Okay, here we go. Let's pop the tape into it. So 
If the mode select switch is in good condition, the tape should go in, sit down, pause for about a tenth of a second, the cylinder should start and it should load the tape. So let's see what's going to happen. That's perfect. And I think the loading motor is still trying, yep, the loading motor is still trying to load. So that tells me the mode select switch is in need of service. Let's just try it a couple times and see if it cleans itself. I'm still going to tear this thing apart and clean the mode select switch because it definitely needs it. See, that time it didn't even unload. Power back on. There it goes, power on. Let's try it again, see if it finishes loading. Got my finger on the belt to detect tension. And yeah, it, it's still trying to load even further. And it shut down. And it ate the tape that time. Wonderful. But like I said, this tape's been eaten hundreds of times before. Okay. Let's clean the mode select switch. I know I've covered this topic before, but remember, two screws. This one's going to be the machine thread or the fine thread screw. And then the screw that hides under this ribbon cable. Be very, very careful of that ribbon cable. It drives the cylinder motor and the capstan motor. It's going to be a coarse plastic thread screw, much like a wood screw. So let's get those zipped out. Then we can very gently open this up to see the mode select switch right there. I know I've covered it multiple, multiple times. Just grab the tab and gently lift up. It'll snap open. And let's take a close up look at that mode select switch and see if it is indeed in need of cleaning. And I'm going to say yes, just looking at that, look how oxidized the switch is. It should be bright silver contacts, especially over here on this side. Look how bad that is. It's actually turning colors. It's oxidized so bad. So once again, stainless steel toothbrush. And we'll scrub this out, wipe it with acetone, which will not damage this type of mode select switch. So there's the tips, the bristles of my stainless toothbrush. And I'm going to zoom out because it's very hard to maintain this thing and keep focus. And we'll see if it's going to stay somewhat put. I have a block of wood holding the mechanism up and I have a block of wood up underneath the chassis to hold it up as well. And of course it's already moving so that's not good. But I'm just going to go ahead and scrub this. Hopefully it'll stay centered in your screen. And I'm pretty happy with those results already. Let's go ahead and clean the movable side, which is done by just wiping gently in one direction, just to clean the wipers. Just like that. Next, we'll wipe it out with a bit of acetone. Acetone will not eat the plastic on these switches, so you don't have to worry about it. I like acetone because it's much stronger than isopropyl alcohol. And then we'll go ahead and wipe off the movable or rotary portion of the switch as well. Looks very good so far. Next comes a little bit of silicon dielectric grease. So this is, I believe, Molly Coat by Dow Corning 111. It's actually a valve sealant, but it is pure silicon dielectric grease. I'm just going to grab some up here. And I'm just going to use a cotton swab. People say don't use it, but... Only been doing it for like 30 years and it works fine.
Okay, for reassembly, make sure that the post is lined up with the dot on the circuit board and make sure that the hole in the mode slick switch, which is slightly out of focus, is straight in line. If not, you'll have to rotate the loading motor to get that in line. Okay, here we go. Let's power this thing up. Let's pop a tape into it and see what it tries to do. That's how it should behave. So let's see if it's gonna play more than, I think it's about seven to 10 seconds before it shuts down. I'll speed this up. And I'm gonna call that good, working absolutely perfectly. Let's go ahead and stop it. We'll test fast forward and rewind at this point. Make sure it rewinds and fast forwards. Perfect. Fast forward. I'm gonna call that good. I'm gonna connect a monitor and make sure it actually has video. Then we'll clean the optical pickup. I'll connect a video capture device and show you video from the DVD and from the VHS. And just because I've had so many problems with these capacitors in the past, I'm gonna go ahead and replace this filter cap. The old one measures 0.02 ohms ESR. And the new one, which is a good quality, I think it's a Panasonic. Measures exactly the same, 0 0.02, which is what I would expect to see from one of these caps. But because the original one is a Suscon cap, as you can see right there, Suscon, and it's only an 85 degrees Celsius rated cap. It says it on here somewhere. There it is down there, 85 degrees Celsius. We're gonna go ahead and replace it just because I'm in here with a good quality 105 degrees Celsius rated cap. All right, good quality 105 degree cap installed on the board. Just gotta put this thing back together. We'll do a DVD cleaning and a complete VCR tape path cleaning and the thing should be ready to go. And here we go once again, gonna get the hate comments down below, but it's okay. I've been doing it for almost 40 years now. Cotton swab soaked with acetone. We're gonna clean the upper cylinder as well as the video heads with it. You can't use a cotton swab to clean video heads. You will destroy them. Uh-huh. Okay, all better. As far as I can tell, I did not destroy the heads. I see two heads right there, a hi-fi head right there, and two heads right there, and a hi-fi head right there. I think we're good. Well, there is the optical pickup. It looks pretty doggone good. Let's get an LED light shining on it. There's a slight amount of dust. Not much whatsoever. So once again, cotton swabbed just moistened, not soaked with regular household glass cleaner, nothing with ammonia, and then just barely a little more weight than the actual cotton swab itself. Downward pressure, circular motions only. You don't want to scrub up and down or right or left because it might scratch the lens, the optical coating on the lens. Dry in, same thing, very, very, very light pressure and rotating the cotton swab while I'm wiping. Let's take another look at it now. No dust whatsoever. Looks absolutely perfect. Okay, time for reassembly, and we'll do a DVD record test, 
and a VCR playback test, make sure everything works good. And if it passes, ship this thing back to my customer. Okay, I have a pre-recorded two hour tape. This is an SP tape and it will only use the SP video heads for playback. So we'll see if the capture device will like the macrovision that it probably is encoded with. with and it seems to be working just fine. So we'll let that play for a few seconds. Then I'm gonna stop it and put in a homemade two hour tape, which is an SLP or a six hour tape. It's gonna use the other two video heads. Yes. So pretty happy with that so far. No. Stop, no. eject. And the six hour tape going in. And hopefully the capture device is still going. It's probably gonna do some auto tracking. It might mute a little bit. And there it goes, auto tracking. And it seems to be pretty happy with that. There, I think it's finished auto tracking. And it looks perfectly fine. So that's only using the six hour video heads and not the two hour SP video heads. And the audio sounds perfect. That's hi-fi audio. Those are the other two heads on the cylinder. All right, let's go ahead and try to copy a DVD from VHS. And then if that works, this thing will be ready to ship back to my customer. Okay, I have a blank DVD minus R here, brand new, never recorded on. I'm gonna go ahead and pop it in the DVD recorder and see if it recognizes that it is an actual blank DVD minus R. And it seemed too. So let's go ahead and go into setup. And I have not set the date or the time on this unit yet, so I'll do that and I'll speed this up. Okay, all that looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop a VHS tape into this unit. And we'll hit the dubbing button and see what happens. But before I do that, let me make sure the tape speed or the DVD speed, I should say, is set to the two hour mode or even one hour. This, this tape is actually only 30 minutes long. So it's set for the highest quality mode, the HQ. So you have these options. So HQ, one hour and one minute. So let's hit the dubbing button and we'll check back in 30 minutes and see what happens. Okay, so the tape has finished playing, just on the black screen on the end of it. So I'm gonna hit stop. It's gonna to write to the disc, which takes just a moment. I'll speed this up for you guys. All right, so now we have to go in and finalize the disc. So I'm gonna go into setup. Actually, I'm gonna stop, because you cannot go into setup until you stop the disc. Stop. And then we'll go down to disk edit. Finalize disk, yes. And once again, I will speed this up. And it shows that it did finalize the disc completely. So I'm gonna stop the unit, put the buttons on the front. I will eject the disc. Reclose the drawer and see if it reads the table of contents and can play. And I'm gonna say success. Let's hit play and see if it plays. So far it looks excellent, but I think that's going to be it. Go ahead and rewind this tape while I do the outro. Anyhow, I'd say this unit is fixed. Just got to put the top back on it and get it ready to ship back to my customer. I certainly hope you enjoyed the repair. 
on the Magnavox ZV450 MW8. Go ahead and leave me a question, a comment, a concern, good or bad. Nothing about the Q-tips. I've used them for almost 40 years with no adverse conditions. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me NorCal715videos at gmail.com. That is the best way to contact me. Please be patient. I have a full-time job and I do these repairs in my spare time. If you try to contact me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, please be aware it might be weeks or even months before I respond. I rarely check those messages. Please, if you want to contact me, use the Gmail address only. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everyone, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really do appreciate it. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.